Do you know where your water comes from? You may not think about it very often, but it's important. We need water to survive. We drink it, we cook with it, we bathe with it, and we wash our dishes with it. Have you ever stopped to think about how much water you use every day? We use between 80 and 100 gallons a day, which is a lot. Here in San Antonio, we get our water from an aquifer. So what is an aquifer? We hear the word aquifer on TV and read it in the newspaper. We know that when our aquifer reaches a certain level in the summer, that we have water restrictions. But how often do people stop to think, what is an aquifer? An aquifer is essentially any rock or sediment layer that contains water. I like to think of it this way. Water soaks into rocks the same way it soaks into a sponge. So I think wet sponge, and I think aquifer. There are spaces in rock, just like there are spaces in this sponge. And as we'll see, this is a very good analogy for our very special aquifer here in San Antonio, the Edwards Aquifer. What happens is that there is water in aquifers and it is pumped out of the ground and into our houses. Some aquifers are small, while others have enough water to supply entire cities, like San Antonio, with water. But when we use more water than the aquifer has in it, this results in water shortages. Water shortages occur during dry periods when water use is high, as in the case of summer. During summer, we water our lawns to keep them alive in the Texas heat, but aquifers aren't refilled during this time because it doesn't rain much in the summer. During times of drought, water use is limited to maintain the health of this system. Let's check this out. We're gonna make our own aquifer. So, in this model, I've put some sand in a fish tank. The matrix of the aquifer is sand. What the aquifer is comprised of is sand. I'm gonna pretend that the sand is rock, which isn't a far stretch. There are rocks comprised entirely of sand, and they're called sandstone. What do you think will happen when I pour the water into the rock of our model? It will move down through the sand and gather at the bottom. When I pour this water into the tank, I'm mimicking when it rains. Watch. What do we see? The water moved down through the sand and gathered at the bottom. So when it rained, the water went into the rock. And since water underground is an aquifer, we've just made a little aquifer. This is how groundwater works. What's groundwater? Groundwater is any water that's below the surface. Often it's flowing. When it rains, the water infiltrates down through the rock until it reaches some layer it can't go through. In this case, the bottom of the fish tank, and it gathers in the spaces between the sand grains. And now you may be asking, what's infiltration? Infiltration is water moving down into the earth because of gravity. In sedimentary rocks, like sandstone, the sand grains do not fit tightly together, and water gathers in the tiny spaces between the sand grains. In this hand, I'm holding a piece of sandstone, and in this hand is a model of sandstone. These are the sand grains, this is the space in between the grains where water can exist. In this model, almost 50% of the total volume of the model is available to hold water. We call the spaces between individual sand grains pores. So water exists in pores within aquifers. Further, we say that the proportion of a rock available for water to inhabit is called porosity. A porous rock can hold much water, while a non-porous rock doesn't have much space at all to hold water. The porosity of our sandstone model is almost 50%, which is amazing when you think about it. That means that half of the total volume of the rock is airspace. And it's true. The porosity of some sandstone is around 50%, while the porosity of other rocks, like granite, is less than 1%. Household examples of porous things include sponges, which hold much water. Non-porous things include glass, plastic, and metal. Now, we know some rocks have a high porosity and hold much water. Now we need to know if water can flow through the matrix of the aquifer and deliver that water to us. The ability of water to flow through something is permeability. Now, we said that a sponge can hold water, but it can also deliver the water. The sponge is permeable, and so water can move through it. How do I know that? Because when the water comes out, we say that the sponge is permeable. Okay. So we've learned about how rock has holes in it called pores. Some rocks have a high porosity, others have a low porosity. Sandstone has a high porosity and is also very permeable, meaning water can flow through it. Now there's something else that I wanna mention. The very top of the water in an aquifer is called the water table. 
Why would we bother to name the very top of the water in an aquifer? When there's water in a swimming pool, we don't give it a name, we just call it the top of the water. But aquifer water is under much closer scrutiny than water in swimming pools. We don't rely on swimming pool water to drink, but we do rely on aquifer water for our drinking water. Specifically, since aquifer water is our only water source, we want to know if it's rising or falling. So we are very interested in water table changes. When it rains hard in San Antonio, streets fill up with water and the water flows downhill under the force of gravity. And that's the same thing that happens in aquifers. Another analogy is a river. Water travels downstream in a river in the same fashion that groundwater travels down gradient in an aquifer. We say that groundwater moves down gradient. In a river, water travels straight, right? Well, in sand aquifers, water can't flow straight, can it? And for water to move down gradient in a sand aquifer, it has to travel in and around all the sand grains. When the water travels around all the sand grains, it travels in a very snake-like way. Okay. So far in this section, we've learned that aquifers are rocks and sediment that have water called groundwater. Groundwater exists in pores and it's always flowing underground. Sounds pretty simple, right? Then let me ask you about the pores that the water is, is in. How big do you think they are? Pretty small, aren't they? Really small, in fact. What do you think can fit through the pores? Well, I'll tell you, not much. Let's do another experiment. I'm gonna see how well aquifers filter water. This is another sandstone aquifer model. When I pour water in it, the water moved down through the sand, just like our last experiment. It rained recently, and some really muddy storm water was made. The rain fell on the ground, started washing away, and picked up some sediment, which is what makes the water muddy. Now, I'm gonna simulate muddy water infiltrating into a sandstone aquifer. Watch what happens when nasty rainwater washes into a sand aquifer. Here I am pouring nasty water into the model. We can see the water trickling down through the sand. It's moving down in all the pores through the sand. Now I'm holding two glasses in my hand. The first one is our original storm water. Pretty muddy, right? This one is the water that went through our model. Not quite as muddy, is it? That's because it was filtered by the sand. Why is it clearer? Because some of the mud in the water got trapped in our sand aquifer. Some of the sediment is in the aquifer, and some of the sediment is in the water. But if we had a larger aquifer, the water would come out cleaner. What does this tell us? This tells us that sand aquifers filter water. I'll say it again. Sand aquifers filter water. Why is this important? Well, we had some sediment in our storm water. What if we had something else in the water instead? What if someone had spilled something like gasoline on the ground? What if it had gotten into our aquifer? Let's take a look at what happens when some nasty chemical contaminant like motor oil, diesel, or any other chemical gets into a sand aquifer. First, what is a contaminant? For our purposes, a contaminant is something present in water that does not belong in water. Often, they are harmful substances. Essentially, in an aquifer, anything other than water is probably a contaminant. Naturally, only rainwater gets into aquifers, so anything man-made that flows into the ground is a contaminant, and a lot of them are nasty things. Let's take a look at things that commonly get into groundwater. Essentially, everything you buy at the store has the potential to get washed into our aquifer in one way or another and is a contaminant. And so, these are things that we are concerned about getting into our water supply. Sometimes contaminants are spilled, other times they're intentionally dumped into the ground. And what happens to all of these contaminants? They enter our aquifer. They make the water unusable to you and me. Who wants to drink water that tastes like gasoline? Not me! But they also hurt other animals that drink the water, like deer and raccoons. Now, chemical contaminants can't be filtered like mud can. But guess what? Something else works in our favor. What happens is that in sandstone aquifers, groundwater flow is slow. How slow? Very slow. When we poured water into our aquifer, the water infiltrated down slowly and came out slowly. Why is that? Water in rivers moves pretty fast, but groundwater moves very slowly in sand aquifers. It comes back to that sinuous way that water has to move. It moves in and around sand grains, like we talked about a few minutes ago. So 
In larger aquifers, what we see is that groundwater flows about this far per day. Water travels this far per day. So if we had a leaking tank at a gas station and some gas leaked out and infiltrated into a sand aquifer, it would be easy to clean it up if it only moved this far per day. We can go dig up that contaminant because it hasn't traveled far. Now, this is used motor oil. I'm going to pour it into a sand aquifer and we're going to observe how oil moves through sand. The oil is thicker, so it moves slower than water, right? It also sticks to the sand better. We don't have a very large aquifer here, but even with this small amount of sand, the oil can barely go anywhere. Well, what does this mean to us? It means if there was an oil spill over a sandstone aquifer, the oil would not go far. What if a tanker truck full of oil wrecked and spilled all of its oil onto a sand aquifer? Since we determined with our experiment that oil sticks to sand, the oil wouldn't travel very far. This lets us clean it up. The danger is that oil got into a sandstone aquifer, but danger is partially avoided because we are able to clean up the mess. If the oil had moved fast through this sand aquifer and had not stuck to it, then that would tell us that some contaminants can move fast in sand aquifers. Contaminants that move fast in aquifers are very, very dangerous. Why are they so dangerous? Well, if something nasty like oil moves slowly, well, it isn't much of a risk. I spill some oil on the ground, it goes nowhere. It isn't great, but at least it doesn't flow far and spread its contamination all around. Now, if some contaminant were to not stick to the soil, then it could infiltrate quickly and then get into the water. Whose water? Your water, my water, our water. And not only is that gross, it's dangerous. We can't drink oil and we can't drink water with oil in it either. So personally, I'm glad that sand aquifers filter so well and hold on to contaminants. That helps keep water in this type of aquifer clean. But see, we don't have a sand aquifer. We have a completely different kind of aquifer. We have a karst aquifer, and we'll learn all about karst aquifers soon. What have we learned so far? Well, first, we learned that we get our water from an aquifer, and an aquifer is a rock that holds water. Second, we've learned that water in aquifers is called groundwater, and that it travels very slowly in sand aquifers. And third, we've also seen that contaminants are often spilled into the ground, but they don't travel very far in sand aquifers. And we also learned that we do not have a sand aquifer here in San Antonio. We have a karst aquifer, whatever that is. Why, you might be asking yourself, why is he telling us all about sand aquifers when we don't even have one here in San Antonio? We have a karst aquifer. Well, I'll tell you why. When most people think aquifer, they think that water is being filtered. And often that is true because many people have sand aquifers, but we do not and so our water is not filtered. We have a very special kind of aquifer here in San Antonio, and in section two, I'm gonna tell you about how it works.